to see so much energy. Like, it's great to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. So uh, this talk is a little bit about, like, computers and, uh, like, the problems that the modern computers have. And I hope, like, uh, we will, like, set a little bit of the stage for the rest of the conference. That from what I see in the agenda, from what I saw in the submissions, will be really amazing. So before I even start, uh, this isn't working. OK. Before I even start, I want to basically use a very common definition of heaven and hell as a way to set up the stage, right? So I think everybody will agree, or some people will not, that heaven is a place where the police are British, the cooks are Italian, the mechanics are German, or the engineers are German, the lovers are Brazilians. I'm sorry, I'm from Brazil, so I needed to make it convenient. And everything is organized by the Swiss. Uh, obviously, if we start messing all around, we will end up with a situation where you have the engineers as Brazilians. So that's what the, the hell is defined at, right? Uh, to show that this talk will be, will be very humble, I will try to redefine hell in a way that is more acceptable to everybody. And I hope that everybody will agree that hell is where the lawyers do exist, right? Uh, just as a disclaimer, like my wife is a lawyer, right? So like I hope nobody takes it personally. So just a quick disclaimer, right? I'm here talking on my behalf. Like even though I work for a large corporation that uh, produced CPUs and recently was affected by interesting stuff, uh, I'm not here to talk about that. I'm not here to talk uh, about like my work. I'm here to talk about like my personal view of what is hacking and what hacking is all, the, all about, right? Uh, so one of the things that I, I, I like to say is like many people uh, associate hacking with art, right? I know there is a lot of discussions, we will get into a little bit of it between like the differentiating of hacking and science. Uh, is it art or is it more science engineering? So one thing I want to say is like if hacking is an art, so I'm sorry, but I will use poetic license. Therefore, I will make lots of generalizations. I will try to make lots of like claims that uh, I hope Everybody understand that there are always exceptions, right? So if I go and say, hey, people proposing mitigations have no clue what they are doing, I hope that everybody understands that I'm generalizing to talk about like the really common case, but there are lots of really amazing exceptions. So I really don't want to offend anybody by the exceptions. So uh, of course, you know, like uh, everybody here is somehow interested in offensive security. Many people, I guess, work on, on the defense side. Many people work as, I, as exploit writers or like providing like a red teaming or like this kind of offensive efforts, reverse engineering and all. So like, I don't intend to give a sermon to whoever are already a priest, right? So instead, you know, like, I will just try to give some like uh, talking points. I will try to give like some ideas that I have and arguments that I use when I discuss vulnerabilities, the importance of the offensive research, how offensive research should drive defense and not the other way around, and uh, the, the, like some ways for us to actually measure it, trying to remove a little bit of the chaos. Uh, obviously, like, uh, I, I hope that most of those points are already known, so I just wanted to give an extra uh, talking point, like an extra argument. But if we need to define the objectives in one image, there is one image that we really like in our team that when, like a, it's very common that when someone is talking about the bug that they found, they, the attacker is God mode, right? It's all powerful attacker that is able to do everything. That attacker knows all the address locations. The attacker knows everything about the target. The attacker has all the possible powers and owns all kinds of machines in all kinds of cases. But uh, it's interesting that the same person goes to talk about a mitigation, and now the attacker is the dumbest guy in the world, right? The attacker don't manage to do much, the attacker is highly limited, and the mitigation is perfect. So this is the kind of things that, like, uh, even though, of course, again, it's a generalization, I think it's fairly agreed in the industry to the point that Halvar, in a current presentation, like a recent presentation of him, he introduced the mitigator, right? That raises the bar until bugs, like, basically can't be seen anymore, right? So I think, like, this is very well understood that right now we are in a state where you know, like bugs continue being exploited, right? There is a lot of talks on mitigation, a lot of people proposing things, but very few that are actually effective. Exploits continue being writing, uh, written, like things continue breaking, like software continue being bad. So maybe there is a better way to do that, and uh, that's one of the things that I want to discuss. So I will start giving you 
three things that, uh, like, if you forget everything that I talk on this, on this presentation, all the formal, like, data that I will try to give and all, all the examples, try to remember at least these three things, and let's use that as a discussion point. You don't need to agree. You just need to remember so we can use this discussion point during the conference, right? So one of them is, like, you know, threat modeling is relatively mature. Right? Uh, we, 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 you know, like there is very, very well-defined ways of doing threat modeling. Like that doesn't mean the companies are applying it properly, but this is a mature area, right? We, we understand security objectives. We understand what is the attackers in the scope. We, we know how to define that. So we understand, like, for example, like what is the difference between the different scenarios where the, a, a specific defense needs to be implemented. This is fairly well-defined. So why we don't, don't apply a very similar approach when we're talking about mitigations? It's interesting, right? Like, when we talk about, hey, there is this threat in a given product that is being, like, engineered, even if it's already uh, existent or, like, being in the very, like, initial stage of defining the threats for that product. Uh, it's common that you see and say, hey, yes, you know, that feature, like, for example, we're going to add a permission in this layer so we can break, like, a given threat that was defined in that threat modeling. That's common. Why we don't do the same with mitigations? Why with mitigations, we just go and say, yeah, you know, it raises the bar, right? And they're going back to the mitigator, right? What does raising the bar mean? Raise the bar to whom? In which situations? In which scenarios? How many times? How much it does raise the bar? Right? We know the cost of implementing a feature in a product, but very rarely we look into the product of maintaining that. So we go and we say, hey, yes, this mitigation raises the bar, and then that mitigation is there forever. Right? And nobody goes back to revisit if this raising the bar is true in the next generation of that same product. Right? Nobody considers that mitigation maintenance and the complexity it actually brings to the, to the whole solution when they're actually proposing it. It, it, it's, it's just like a, I just can't understand why we can't apply a more mature process defining that. So, you know, like Ons, uh, uh, a mathematician, a professor of mine, actually made a joke with me, right? Uh, uh, I did engineering, right? So, like, uh, my professor used it to make fun of, like, uh, engineering trying to do math. So, he said that, you know, like, a proof by induction for an engineering is if it works for case one, works for case two, and works for case three, it works for all the cases. Obviously, this is completely wrong, but it's actually very interesting for us to leverage. Why we don't say then, it's if you want to propose a mitigation, that mitigation needs to work for at least three real vulnerabilities completely. It needs to break at least three real cases in real use of your software, at least for three cases. That's a proposal that I am making. Let's, let's keep that proposal in mind, right, on, on, on when we discuss, like, mitigations. So that's the first one. The second one, uh, there has been a lot of formalization on, on exploits and exploit writing and the process of engineering exploits, right? We, I will discuss like a, a little bit deeper that during this talk. But you know, like a, one thing that is, is, is interesting is that uh, you know, like a, a understanding one instance of an exploit, understanding someone presenting one instance of an exploit or how that given person wrote a given exploit doesn't really mean you are really understanding how those exploits work, how vulnerability and exploit writing really works. And I don't like, this is important because many times I see folks going like to DEF CON, Black Hat, Offensive CON, and they learn a lot, right? I really, really think we're going to all learn a lot here. But you know, like, uh, that doesn't mean we know how to do it, right? The ones that know how to do it are people doing it. So I really suggest that you, know, like, uh, you get your learnings and go and practice and do it. And if you don't do it, it's okay. You have a good understanding, but don't go and start proposing mitigations as if you really understand how exploits really work. Because I really don't think this, this is a good way of doing it. Uh, I, I really recommend you to be careful on that, right? And I recommend that, like I'm recommending this audience, but uh, the same applies everywhere, right? One of the biggest suffering that I believe we have in this industry is we have a very few folks that are really focused in understanding offensive security. And when they actually do you not, know, they spend a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of talent in doing it, then they are not really able to influence mitigations in many times because they end up in discussions with people that don't really fully understand the problem but that have a say 
or that believe they understand a problem just because they went into one presentation and understood what was going on in that presentation. It's important to say that you know, like a, when a, a presenter brings like a, a, their, their findings, right, they don't talk about like a lots of other things that maybe they tried and failed when trying to exploit that. They don't talk about all the cases that were not exploitable at all, right? They talk about when they came and a success case, a very nice like a new technique that they found, a very nice new way, a new primitive that they acquired, and how they actually leverage that in a given case. But all these other engineering parts, all these other really huge challenges in writing a real exploit, that's not really necessarily discussed. And even if it is, in one hour of a talk, it's not really easy to go deep on those areas. And that makes a huge difference in really understanding how exploits actually work, and uh, that understanding is really necessary if you want to propose a real mitigation, right? Uh, if you're interested in this kind of discussion, specifically understand a little bit more on the discussions on, on those challenges, there was a very, very cool conversation that was held in, in New York Poly University. So I put like a reference here so later on anybody can go get the materials and, and, and see some of the arguments there. I really recommend. So the second point then to take out is basically then like a, if someone is proposing a mitigation, let's really hope and demand that that person really understands the problem. That understanding is either through really writing real life exploits against real life systems, right? Or at least pairing up with someone who actually does have that understanding. So that's really offense driving defense. That's really having understanding before you going and, and proposing like a mitigation, right? So one thing is important, right? Like that doesn't mean that everybody who really like works hard in mitigations necessarily love to do exploit writing. It's, it, it, it might be even a different kind of skill and talent and some folks don't really enjoy that. I at least know one of the top like guys writing mitigations. He don't really like to write exploits but they have a full understanding of how exploit works. He's capable of doing it. He did it in, mo in many times and many scenarios. So he fully understands the problem before going after uh, proposing a mitigation. And then the third point, it, it goes a little bit uh, back into like, uh, the researcher sharing knowledge, right? The, uh, on top of the fact that the researcher, when it's sharing something in a presentation, there is a lot of things on difficulties that are not really included there. There is so many times, you know, like a, a lot of other things that the researcher decides to not discuss either because there is no time or because the researcher don't really notice there was a bigger picture in whatever the, the researcher was presenting, or even like Dunning-Kruger like syndrome, like where the researcher really believes that they don't know enough, even though they really do, but they really feel that they are not empowered or they don't know enough to discuss a given topic, so they just leave it out. So this, this also happens. But one of the, 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 the problems that we have there is we end up having all kinds of people giving presentations, right? So you go, and uh, I even though you, know, like, uh, you believe that you know, like, there is a lot of cool coolness there, you might have like, a really interesting work in a given area, but it it's completely misses the, the higher picture. And then some somebody else just see that presentation, notice that maybe there is a bigger impact, and it starts going back and presenting, right? So that, that is very common, right? We see, like, every time that there is a new vulnerability, it's very impressive, right? Nobody found the vulnerability before. Suddenly, some researcher goes, find it, documents, do a lot of work, a lot of energy, and have a material, then everybody in the world became an expert. You start seeing presentations everywhere. Right, talking about it, talking about mitigations, talking about like that vulnerability that the person was not even involved and likely don't necessarily fully understand. So this is a problem because you end up creating this imbalance, right, where there is a lot of flow of information going on and they're like who actually have the skills in that flow of information, right? The original finder many times gets missed or it's not even necessarily heard because of so much voices. So here's like the, the third point that I would like to, to make again, right? So investment in defense should be driven by offense, not the other way around. If you do have an offensive security team or if you work in offense, you are the one that should be driving defense, not the other way. 
So we see like many times, you know, like uh, in, in corporations, right? You have like security architects, uh, you have like the people working on the design or uh, on, on people working in the different layers of defense. And in many times they go and they drive the discussions because they understand better the corporation or they understand better the process or they have it like just in a better position to actually drive it. If you're doing it that way, you're basically wasting your efforts in offense. You're finding things, you have all these skills, but you're not leveraging it. So let's, let's make sure that uh, we understand that and we have like really offense driving the need for defense. If we had that, it would be much easier to just fire a conference like this, right? The, uh, I, I mean, like when, when I see a conference that is obviously necessary, that is obviously bringing like top talent to the country to discuss very important matters, and the, the first thing that happens in the conference is just find the existence of the conference. We know that there is something wrong with the industry as a whole. We need more support for the offensive research, and we need offensive to be able to drive defense, and people need to recognize that. So this is the third point that I really hope everybody will remember. So if we continue and we start discussing, as I mentioned in, in, in one of the points, right, uh, there is like a need for formalization, right? And uh, I, I, I want to reemphasize that need because we do need better ways to scale. Uh, right now, one of the challenges is like, how do we really scale knowledge, right? I think uh, one of the main reasons that there is so much disbalance in knowledge in the industry is exactly because scal scaling the knowledge is very hard. Uh, we, we, don't, we can't really go and demand security researchers that really love what they do, have all the talent in doing and, and writing exploits, to now go and also be responsible for making sure that the rest of the organization, lots of folks that don't really want to spend time understanding things, lots of folks that don't really care about understanding or don't really necessarily want to understand things, uh, uh, will start learning, right? It, it's just not possible. So we do need other means. We do need other ways to better teach security. So that's where I think the academia should be the one helping us, right? I think like, you know, like a, while there, is, there should be a state of the art, there should be you know, like a, the, the research that is done in the industry, I, I, I am always hopeful that the academia will be the one leading the way, both like preparing new generations and actually showing what's going to be next, right? What is the technology that we don't even think about because they have the time to do it while the people in the industry don't necessarily do. But unfortunately, specifically on the offensive security research, there is not a lot coming out. Uh, it's getting better, right? And again, it's, it's a huge generalization, you know, like, and it might be an unfair criticism to many of the professors that I hope many of them are here. So there are focus, there are some that are doing amazing work. But if you look into the number of actually people in the academia, the number of those that are actually doing something on, 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 on offensive research, the number of papers that are being published and the quality, then you see there is a huge disbalance. The academia is not really helping right now. And everything is being driven by the industry. And when things are driven by, by the industry, we end up having like people who love the thing, they go and they do what they love and they don't really care. They share knowledge based on what they want to share and that's really great and we should actually incentivize that to continue. And then we have like the corporations having lots of skills but sharing them as their, their convenience, right? So that's not, what, not, not the ideal. The formalization actually helps the academia or the academic world to actually get up to speed and start maybe contributing, right? And I believe this is actually very important. There is a trend, right, like formalization of like lots of things that are like so far are just like seen as art or practitioners, right, things that are known on the exploit writing community, but, it, it, and by the way, very well documented. It, it's not like it's not well documented or there are no enough examples out there. It's just that they don't really abstract enough to actually help someone formalize on the bigger picture and really understand the, the inner problems. So it's very important. One of the trends there, like it's, it's really LangSec, right? So LangSec has started like trying to formalize certain things. Of course, they're like they focusing it's in, in, in one very important problem in security. But for that, uh, for that formalization to work, they started evolving lots of the terminology. They started like helping bringing some of this formalization. But we need more, right? Um, one of the things that you know, like uh, uh, I want to mention is that. If we go and we have a state of the art and we start working on formalization, we still have a challenge, which is how do we bring that state of the art, that formalized understanding, that new view of security and the right ways of doing security 
to an actual development, right? As I mentioned in the very beginning, right, threat modeling is fairly mature. Companies know, like uh, at least mature companies, like, uh, like companies that care, they know how to do secure development life cycle, right? They know how to do the process. They might fail in the engineering side, right? And, 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 and that is, uh, is impossible to argue. But the process itself is well-defined. The companies, in theory, are investing on that. For them to get better, we just need to make sure that whatever they're having in the process actually ties back to the reality and to actually impact more. So I, I put like two examples where LangSec is bringing a new understanding on the problem, a new way of doing something. But then the secure development materials, all the materials that are basically taught to the developers, that are shared around the world, that are taught even to security people, they, they are not following up, right? Like they, they basically conflict with that. So the first one is like, for example, in, 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 in the secure development, one of the rules, right, or best practice or whatever name they want to use there, is that you know, like the input is checked as close as to the usage of that input as possible. That's actually what gave us the shotgun parsing, right? Where the parsers are spread all across like the code. And as more as the code grows, as more as the new features are being added, as more complicated that actually gets. And that's very hard to secure, right? So, but that's, that's the recommendation from secure development, right? If we look into the proposal from, from LangSec though, it's more like, hey, let's actually parse things and validate things as we receive, as the entry point of that data, right? In the boundary of that data. So this is a conflicting message. I actually had an, an interesting conversation with Sergey Bratos. There are answers. There are ways of actually making them match. But we need to make sure this happens. Otherwise, we have conflicting messages. And uh, people who are not really like in the area, who are not really deep to understanding on the area, they will actually understand it wrong. And they might not follow whatever is the state of the art. Another example, which is very similar, but it's, it's still a little bit different. So in, in, in secure development, we always talk about like, hey, have intrinsically secure functions, right? Make sure that each part of the system is intrinsically secure. As if when you compose things that are secure, you still keep that secure property, which we know it's not true. But that's actually one of the rules there. And again, it's conflicting with the idea of having like the, the, the input fully validated and understood, right? So we do need ha to have a better way to solve even those basic things when we evolve in the state of the art. And I think that you know, like, uh, this, this, this audience uh, is, is able to help like, uh, bridging those gaps. So there is more formalizations, right? In, in the recent years, there is actually two works that I really want to, to mention, right? One was by Julian Vanegge, uh, in which he formalized like a like HIP, right? The idea is like uh, you can, uh, so it always started like in 2012, when he actually uh, talked about like a, a grand challenge for automated exploiting, right? So how you could automatically generate an exploit. So of course there is, <laughs> Lots of problems in doing that. We, we saw, we, we, we probably everyone here is aware of the DARPA report on, on, on that area. That was very, very cool. But then like we know that it only works for like very basic cases. So Julian was like evolving the state of the art and, uh, and, and a later re result from that work came with like the formalization of HIP. So it's interesting, it's, it's a still early work, right, but with really good results. But you can leverage that when you're actually discussing mitigations, right? You can actually really see a mitigation applied in a, in a real mathematical model and see where it will impact and what are the primitives that actually this removes. So I think this work really needs to be prized and, and, and more of that needs to come. And more recently, we have like Halvers, uh, he released a paper and gave a talk so 2017, 2018 is the time frame where he provided like a theoretical or mathematical understanding of like why exploits are actually possible, right? What is really exploit writing, why they, they exist, right? And, and, and how we can actually see that. It's very surprising to me though that this work is actually from 2017. Why the academia didn't do something like that back in 2000, I don't know, 2000, end of the 90s. Right? This is something that we should not have one of the top talents of our industry working on. Right? This is something that the academia could have done, but they didn't. So I'm glad that uh, like, uh, he actually took the burden and uh, went ahead and, and provided uh, something there. 
Of course, you know, like I'm not trying to be comprehensive, right? Formalizations are happening, and uh, as more the time is passing, as 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 more as you know, like this, uh, we we see it. But then, you know, like uh, one thing that is interesting is like this knowledge bridge between practitioners and actually the formalization and what is necessary for the academia to actually get into the state of the art seems to be everywhere. It's cool to see how practitioners, if you give time and uh, when they, the field start mat mat maturing, it start actually coining definitions that uh, like go back to the, 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 the theory of computing, right? So another day I was actually uh, trying to learn a little bit more about like compression algorithms and I come up with a blog post Literally, a blog post in a blog that I never heard before. Uh, maybe the guy is very famous in, in that area. I don't know. But then, like, a, there was a sentence there that I thought was, like, really, really interesting. Because look into what he was basically noticing, right, based on his experience as a practitioner in doing compression algorithms. Like, it was like a modern compressor is a bit like a compiler. The compressor data is a kind of program in bytecode, and the decompressor is just an interpreter that runs that bytecode. It's very interesting that this is very close to the definition of like the weird machine where you have like an input to a software is some, is like or data like to a program is essentially driving the code of that program. And an exploit is just you using that, uh, that driving uh, capabilities that you have in scenarios that were unexpected uh, by the original software intention. So it's interesting to see that a, a, a practitioner in a completely different field, when he evolved and he started looking to the problems in his field, uh, he basically came up with a very similar conclusion. And it all goes back to the basis of computing. And that's something that academia should be very good at doing. So if we help them tie the bridge, bridge the gap, sorry, uh, essentially they will be able to help us in, in exploits as well, I'm sure. So uh, obviously I'm not trying to be comprehensive right here in the list, but then like, uh, it's not to say that then like, there were no really early tries on defining what is, what, uh, what is an exploit or how exploits work. So Gerard, uh, so he's actually way ahead of his time, right? Like, uh, like uh, he's definitely way ahead of his time. In 2002, he actually tried to, to start defining what is really an exploit, right? It's interesting that in, 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 in that work, in that definition that he put together, he started defining things that are essential for us to actually work on formalizing. Like uh, what are really the primitives? Why the primitives can be grouped together? How do you untie uh, the ability of exploiting uh, multiple, how you tie actually the ability of exploiting multiple vulnerabilities together to leverage those primitives to get something better in the system? So all that came like a really a while back, but it was more like, here are examples of that, then here's a model of that. <coughs> so also, you know, like, uh, we can see that the companies are trying to make an effort there, right? Using offensive knowledge or understanding to go back and, and, and propose mitigation. So Microsoft is a good example in the past years, right? Where they, even though they're, they're like, they do have like an offensive security team or whatever, but they, more than that, they leverage the fact that they're buying real exploits from researchers to really understand how those exploits work, what these exploits really abuse on the system, and what can be changed in the system. But this, like, and, and actually uh, from Microsoft, uh, uh, Matt Miller a while back, he started presenting an, th this idea, right, on, hey, we can leverage this data, we can leverage this know-how to actually drive mitigations. A more recent example by Microsoft is their presentation in the Blue Hat conference uh, in Israel, in which they basically showed how they're leveraging new hardware features to actually implement future mitigations. So they're bringing like, to the scope of the protection of the OS things that in the past were not, like for example, a physical attacker. So it, it, it's very interesting to see that. That's all coming just because someone has spent the time defining it. Someone has spent the time putting together the data set. This should be academic work. This should be where the academia is driving us. But unfortunately, so far it is not. Uh, one another example, this one actually came from the academia, right? And it's, it's a good success case for the academia, in my opinion, is the definition of ROP, right? Everybody knew what ROP long before the academia got to invent the term, okay? So this started way back with Solar Designer, Exploit, or like returning to LibC, expanded with Rafal, like using returning to PLT, and so on. There were many other works, like everyone that were really serious exploit writer understood that possibility, 
right, and knew that long before 2007. But in 2007, someone on the academia finally defined it, put it in, in, in better words, like really helped others understand it in a framework, coined a term for that that is more generalized that can be used everywhere. And now we, we see like ROP being used all the time in all the places. So it, it was useful. You see, in the end, like we might be a bit upset. Like I, I am always a bit upset when someone starts talking about ROP and saying that, hey, this guy created ROP. Yes, he did not. But there is a contribution there that I must admit, which helped like everybody generalize and everybody construct something using the same terminology, using similar approaches. And that actually helped the academia to try to do some things on that area. Actually, that's why we see lots of work coming out of the academia uh, involving ROPs and like how create gadgets. And they are able now to leverage that work in, in new attacks. So when we look into like the, the, the latest attacks, like uh, the, the latest side channel attacks, you see academics using terms like gadgets. So I, I, I like it. You know, like when I see someone that is starting uh, in, in the research, who is starting in, in, in the academia, and that person is able to use the proper terminology and all, even though they are not necessarily connected to the hacking community, to this practitioner community, I, I think it's very good, and I think we're bringing more talent to that, to that area. Uh, so this don't have a button end. How do I press end? Do you mind if you press on the laptop? So for the conclusion, right, like since like my time is almost up, I would like to basically say, like remind everyone on the three points that, uh, that I've mentioned before, right? So the first one and a uh, resume of these three points is like a vulnerability mitigation needs to address a class of vulnerabilities and it should mitigate, at least fully mitigate, three real cases of that. Let's try to make that uh, 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 a baseline for accepting a mitigation, okay? Uh, someone proposing a mitigation really to really understand the problem, either because that person is an actual active exploit writer, actually writing exploits for similar kinds of software that this mitigation will be used, or because it's paired together with someone who actually does that, which is basically offense driving defense, which is the latest point. Let's make sure that this is happening. Let's remember that this is very important. Uh, together with like, uh, the work for this keynote, uh, I will be releasing a paper with some co-workers uh, where we basically trying to be a model like uh, the, this kind of defenses. So the idea is like uh, we use a set theory to create a mathematical model of what is an exploit and what is a mitigation and how we apply that. The paper will be available for everyone. I will ask to share later with the material together with the PPT. Uh, but since it's math and math might be boring for many, I decided to not necessarily cover it on the deck. So thank you very much. I don't know how to go here.